Welcome everyone. We'll let people settle in. Uh, my name is Ron Blake. I'd like to welcome you to the school seminar on political science and international studies. And to start with, I'd like to acknowledge that we live and work on Aboriginal land at a time of ongoing conflict. Our school seeks to understand this conflict and how to better engage Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledges and practices. As I flagged last year, we have a couple of seminars on this topic coming up, including one with Professor Sarah Madison in a couple of weeks, uh, and I'll be sending around um, information about that soon. But for now, it's my pleasure and my privilege to introduce Professor Mervyn Frost. Now, as a, he has been, and for a long time, a towering figure in international <laughs> politics, so that makes it quite difficult to introduce someone as prominent as Mervyn. So I'd like to start with the kind of the formalities. He uh, grew up in South Africa, but spent most of his academic career in the UK, where he was professor of international politics at the University of Kent, and uh, at King's College London, where he was also for seven years head of war studies. At the moment, Mervyn is in Australia uh, as a professorial fellow uh, in international ethics at UNSW in Canberra. Now, most of you would know Mervyn's work uh, on international ethics. Uh, um, I have for many years read, but also taught Mervyn's work on ethics. His contribution on normative theory in the early, mid 1980s was revolutionary in many ways. You know, at the time, for those of you who are old enough, I uh, was dominated very much by positivist kind of approaches, and it was a very narrow field. And Mervyn not only was one of the few people who critiqued positivism and the kind of approaches that came with it, but really engaged uh, ethics uh, uh, head on in a way that hasn't been done before. And the fact that we still read him today after decades is really a testimony to the, the vision that he had and continues to have. Mervyn also works on a range of other themes on failed states and asymmetric warfare. And um, I was uh, particularly privileged to work with him about 12, 13 years ago, together with Emma Hutchison, on the topic of emotions for a journal special issue he co-edited on the politics of compassion. Uh, his Mervyn's latest book, and yeah, I was, was going to say the first one, the, the, the ethics one, of course, was a CUP book in the mid '80s. His latest book <laughs> is here, and I'm afraid I only have like the, yes, the no, paper version right. of it. So I've only read about a third of it, and I very much look forward to the actual proper print on it is a critical engagement with the practice theory, practice theory in international politics. And as you know, this is sort of a topic that has very much uh, become a huge uh, uh, topic of debate over the last sort of five or six years um, in an attempt to sort of reach beyond the dualism of structure agency or kind of material ideational approaches to see how practices can converge them. And, and Merwin's book, uh, uh, co-written with uh, Sylvia Lechner is really an attempt to engage critically with that literature, but also in a very interdisciplinary way through Hegel, Wittgenstein, and a range of kind of thinkers to see how what we can use in practice here and how we can go beyond it. So we very much look forward to hearing from Mervyn about that, and we'll take about 40, 45 minutes. It's plenty of time to engage uh, Mervyn after that. So thank you so much for coming up from Canberra to join us in the brutal winter here in, in <laughs> Brisbane and to share your, your new book. Well, thank you very much for those um, warm words of welcome. I feel really delighted to be back here. I was last in this room, I recall, uh, it felt like this room, it might not have been. Uh, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, we have in, 20, the room. in 2014, uh, for a, a kind of assessment of the department which then, as now, was outstanding. So I'm really pleased to be back in this place. Um, also pleased to be here where it's a bit warmer <laughs> than, than Canberra. Uh, it feels like where I lived for a long time in the University of Natal in Durban, where it had a, a, a climate like this, which is lovely. Now, just at, at the outset, um, Sylvia, about my own trajectory is, you know, academics come in two varieties. They're either foxes or hedgehogs. I'm clearly not a fox. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody, those of you who've read me uh, will know that I've been banging on kind of in the same line since the very beginning. I don't pick uh, different topics. In the, I'm always trying to 
developed this, what I originally called constitutive theory. It's changed now to practice theory. And uh, my current project is to see how it cashes out. If you were to take this seriously, what would we IR scholars be doing? Um, in your introduction, you said something about in the bad old days when the positivists were dominant. Well, they seem to be still with, with us. <laughs> uh, not here. When I go to the United States, uh, I don't see much of anything along the lines of what we're doing here. So I think we're still you know, uh, uh, fencing against that target. Um, so all of this today, uh, I'll simply go on for the allotted time and then I'll stop. <laughs> because I, you know, I've got a lot to say, but by the time I've finished, I will have said uh, most of, of it, setting out the core arguments of this book. So this is not something new. If you want the details, it's in the book. Now, I'm going to set out the bare bones at the beginning of the argument very cursorily because I assume that most of the people in this room are not hard-nosed positivists, so we can kind of scream over that or, or get over that bit quite quickly and then get on to what I think are the, are the implications of doing that. So um, the first heading then is IR based on understanding, not observation. So the whole thrust of our analysis is one that stresses the importance of interpretation as opposed to uh, observation and looking for correlations and st statistical correlations between um, variables. Um, the word we use, uh, the, the two words juxtaposed to each other that we use a lot in this book is the externalist approach to international relations versus internalist. And um, we are very critical of externalist or the external point of view. Um, ours is thoroughgoing internalist. The key positivist insight on which, on what, which we build our case <coughs> is offered by that um, follower of the later Wittgenstein, Peter Winch, in his very well-known book, The Idea of a Social Science, whose central point is that social actions can only be f understood from within the social practices in which they're located. Mm -hmm. He used examples from the field of anthropology, and we use our examples from the field of international relations. So here is one absolutely simple one, that in order to interpret, um, well, let me not use the one we use in the book, but one from just this week. I sit in my office at the Australian Defence Force Academy, and I look over this beautiful parade ground. Um, and I'm not stupid enough to walk across it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, of an evening, uh, this little group come marching out, get right, get right, get, they halt in front of the flagpole, the bugle sound, the flag comes down, the pipes, the, the bagpipe is low, and then left, right, left, right, they go away. Now, you know, on pure observation, I'd say there's some colored material hanging on a pole, they pull this colored material down, they make a noise with their little trumpets, and for some reason they walk in step. But I know what's going on because I know a great deal about the practice in which these things are located. This is, you know, uh, bringing down the flag at uh, the retreat at the end of the day. So I don't only know about the practice of how to do that little ceremony. I know that that links them to the Australian military. And that big parade ground says a lot about the uh, military. And I know that that links it to the Australian state. And I know that that links it to the global system of practice of states. So I can make sense of that little maneuver that I'm watching through my window by, through my knowledge of this world global practice of 195 states. Um, now, our claim then, and it's a really bold claim is that all of the actions that we're interested in in international relations and I, I ask my students to write down a short list of what they're interested in on the list are actions and the, cla the central claim of this whole book with all its philosophical para uh, uh, paraphernalia is to say that you can't understand anything on that list 
and has to get a grip on these global practices. That's that. So we get little pauses. That's pause. The next bit is about we make a very strong distinction between actions and practices. And the people in our science are contemporary practice theorists. Contemporary practice theorists, uh, a friend of mine, uh, 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 Puglio and Adler have written on this and that. We use that as, a, as, a, as, a, as the target for this part of the argument. Is say that Actions and practices are the same. You know, what I do is practice and actions. Uh, they're synonyms, in effect, in effect. And part of their argument is, if we want to understand... You know, let me back off a bit. They see this discipline of IR as beset with a never-ending series of great debates. You know, what kind of discipline are we? can never decide what we do. You know, first, second, third, and then you can't even decide what the fourth great debate is. You at such sixes and six. So the practice theorist said, "Let's forget all that stuff. Let's just look at what people do. Let's get down to the brass tacks, and let's go and see that French diplomats drink tea at five o'clock every afternoon. And if you do a kind of anthropolo anthropological close observation of their tea drinking, you get to understand that that's where the action takes place." But for them, the discipline is about the micro-observation of these practices. And then you build up a big pile of your micro-observation. Then you'll know everything about everything. Now, so Sylvia and I say that won't work because every one of the actions you're interested in is, is located in a practice. Um, here's another example. At the weekly press conferences in Britain, Yeah, yeah, Britain. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going, through, we're going through a crisis at the moment. Anyway, the chief Bre Brexit negotiator at the moment, believe it or not, I, I, I was dumbfounded to find it. His name is David Frost. <laughs> no family, I can tell you. Anyway, he meets at the weekly event. He's the Brexit negotiator, and he meets Michel Barnier. Now, no one can make any sense of what these two gentlemen are doing in these negotiations, unless you know a great deal about the, that big practice called the European Union in the wider practice of the global practice of states. So uh, the second point then, the first was internal versus external, the second is actions are not the same as practices. You need the concept practice to make sense of social actions. Last example here, this afternoon, here we are doing something. It's called an academic seminar. Nobody could give you a proper account of what we're doing unless you had some knowledge of the practice of university life in a global practice of university life. So what are the features of practices that are crucial? And then there's a list, and I'll go through it briefly. At question time, you can come back at me about any of these items. The first is to understand an action within the practice in which it is constituted as an action of a certain kind, you need some comprehen comprehension of rule following. So taking our lead from Wittgenstein, we attach a specific meaning to the phrase rule following. We don't mean there's a rule that says don't leave your cups on the table after the seminar and then you listen to the rule and uh, do exactly that. Rule following means being able to do something and knowing what would count as getting it wrong. So actions are that sort of thing. You learn how to do it, and then in learning how to do it, you learn what would count as a mistake. Um, so we're not talking about rules like all travelers arriving here must show their passports, which in result in travelers doing that. Instead, we take an action to be a manifestation of rule following when an actor and other participants in a practice can distinguish between getting it right and not getting it right. So, for example, the audience here today listening to me present this paper in English would be able to spot a grammatical mistake uh, were I to one make. Uh, straight away, all of you, got it. In other words, you know how to follow the rules of English grammar. So, learning how to identify mistakes is an absolute key component 
of learning how to understand the practice. So when I first uh, discussed this book with Sylvia, I wanted to write the whole book about mistakes in international relations. I thought that would be a nice. She prevailed on me uh, not to do it that way, and uh, I can't prevail against her. She was a very powerful character. So <coughs> the second feature of practices is holism. So all practices that of the kind we're talking about have to be understood in a holist way. What this means is that the actions within a given practice, including international practices, presuppose an understanding of a wide set of rules, not just one set of rules, like how how to use or how to strike the flag at the end of the day. To understand actions in practices, you need to get a grip on the whole set. A simple il illustration may be found in games, all games. To know what scoring is. There's a game that I still don't quite understand the rules of, so I'm a novice. And that's called Australian rule football. And they're the wrong number of poles, and the guys keep hitting the ball off their hand like this. It seems crazy. And anyway, in order for me to understand Australian rules football, it's no use me just getting a grip on one action. I need to understand the whole set of rules that would enable me to understand what these men and women are doing. Um, now, I use games to de demonstrate that point, but by the end of this paper, I want to move quickly away from games because in the early days of constitutive theory, I got lots of criticism because people said, well, international relations is not a game. And of course it's not a game, but it is a practice and it has this feature in common with games of rule following which we have to understand in a whole sense. S s next point is that in order to understand a practice you need to understand the distinction between regulative and constitutive rules. Regulative rules place constraints on what kinds of conduct are acceptable within a given practice. In global society of sovereign states many international laws are regulative. They prescribe how states may use the sea for fishing, the air for flying airplanes in, and they're moving towards uh, negotiating some rules for how, how you might use space uh, for your satellites and so on. But distinct from regulative rules, which simply constrain behavior, are rules which specify what conditions have to be met for an actor, individual or collective, to qualify as a participant in good standing. So. All of you here are participants in good standing, as far as I know. But what are the criteria for participating in, a, in an academic seminar? And you know, we could spell that out. And all practices have that sort of criteria. So in the global practice of states, the first question would be, well, if the participants are states, what is a state? And how does one get to be one? And I'll tell you one way you can't. You can't just say, I want to be one because there's a funny little place called the Republic of Somaliland which says exactly that, I want to be one. It's got capital city, airfields, hospitals, it collects its tax, it's got its army, it's got its police force, it's got all the, uh, uh, the stuff of states and it's not a state. Why? Because the constitutive rules of statehood are determined by the practice as a whole and we could go into that, but it is not a state. It wants to be one. Next heading, all these features of practices is reciprocal recognition. And all of this strikes me as utterly self-evident. So what amazes me is why practice theory isn't the dominant theory. Anyway, the next is reciprocal recognition. So to become a participant in a practice to, through these constitutive rules, part of what we're saying then is you have to learn to do what is needed to get the recognition that participants need. So here I am, enjoying the recognition of a visiting professor. Uh, and I know that he gives this to me, and I give uh, similar recognition to all of you. And that's absolutely fundamental. The next feature of practices is the importance of meaning. So what you have, what one has to do to understand a practice is understand the meaning that the participants give to the various moves that they're entitled to make. Um, 
so, for example, one of the things that diplomats can do, it's an elaborate thing, but I still don't quite know how to do it. They can execute a day marsh. Now, some of you might, who teach diplomatic history will tell me what a day marsh is. But anyway, diplomats learn that. It has a very specific meaning. So when the diplomats, the ambassador of some country, executes a demarche against the host country in which he is, this is a mighty great <coughs> form of protest. But you need to understand the meaning of that. And then I now get to what, for me, is the most important part of this practice approach, which is not only do you have to understand the regulatory rules, the constitutive rules, the meaning in, in a holist way, in all practices, not some practices, you have to understand the normative or ethical underpinnings of that practice. So here we are this afternoon, doing what we're doing. Deep into the meaning of what we are doing are a whole bunch of ethical commitments. So we, I take it that we're all committed to the pursuit of truth, uh, understanding, explanation. We, we commit to opposing plagiarism, all kinds of academic cheating, cooking the books, um, fiddling with the evidence, and so on. I once worked for my very first professor, and uh, one of his students knocked on his door one day, or knocked on my door. I was a junior lecturer. Knocked, knocked on uh, Frost. I was Mr. Frost in there. Mr. Frost. This professor has been walking around the world, uh, delivering papers at conferences like this one. But I got hold of one of these papers, and it's actually chapter one of my thesis. <laughs> oh, well, that was the end of that man. He was no longer constituted as a fully functioning participant in the practice. So the key point, then, is practices have built into them ethical components. So let me just go slowly for a bit. Why is that an important point to make? I would hope that if you are convinced by practice theory, as I put it to you this afternoon, that you'll never do the following, which I find in textbook after textbook. Textbook after textbook has all the main bits of IR, you know, the various approaches, the great debates. And if you're lucky, in the final chapter, you'll get a little bit about ethics, feminist approaches, ethical approaches, and something about the environment, right at the end. <laughs> now, the bit that concerns me are these ethical approaches, as if international relations could go, and we're interested in ethics only at the margins where it might count. You know, you might get a good country that's concerned with fighting f wars fairly, or a, a good country that's concerned about injustice. On this account, we're giving the ethics, you can't understand the first move about any of the actions until you understand what the ethical underpinnings of the practice are. So practices come in different shapes, and the quick uh, uh, shapes and forms. An important distinction for us is between purposive and um, uh, practical, or purposive associations and authoritative practices. Now those of you who are Oakshotians will recognize that I'm we're going over that ground again. A purpose of association is like, uh, in this country they used to make, I don't know if they still do, a, a kind of motor car called Holden. Don't make them anymore. Don't make them anymore. Anyway, so a purpose of association <laughs> would be a group of people who get together to form a practice to do something, a specific purpose, make motor cars. Whereas the thing about authoritative practices, which I find really intriguing, is that what we value about those practices is not that they fulfill some pre-existing purpose. It's only in that practice that we come to enjoy a status that is very valuable to us. So take, for example, citizenship, which is the one, an easy one, is uh, for all of us in this room, I suppose all of us live in democracies, I'm not sure, I didn't used to, but anyway, for us, being citizens in a democracy is a value, is extremely important ethical value for us, but it can only be had if you're a citizen in a democracy. You can't have that value 
by living in something that's not a democracy or, uh, or uh, in a relevant sense. So authoritative practices seem to me of particularly import particular importance in international relations. Who am I arguing against here, or who are we arguing against? Mm. One of the targets is the English school. Mm. The English school give us this weirdish picture of there's a world with states wandering around there, and then they might get together to form an, a society for whatever purposes they, th they, they hold dear. So the society of states is some kind of thing that came into being through a process of contract of some kind. So the purposes that the society of states served on the English school count would be prior, would have existed prior to the society of states coming into being. On our view, in the practice of states, we enjoy certain fundamental values, like sovereignty, which is a certain kind of freedom which cannot be had in any other way other than being a participant in that state. So citizenship is a similar kind of status. Um, holding the rights that I hold dear is also to be constituted as having a certain value in the practice which we call the global rights practice. It's only in that practice that you get constituted as a rights of it. You don't first have rights and then wonder how to protect them. So uh, th there's a paragraph here which I'll just quickly go through. Um, identities, ethics, and inclusion. In authoritative practices, those who qualify as participants hold their status as such to be a valued um, ethical identity. The loss of that identity would be a major setback for them. Let me illustrate this by talking about myself for a second. In the practice of university life, which is both a purposive practice and an authoritative one, I am currently constituted as a professor. This is a status that I value, and it is one that I can only hold if you give me that kind of recognition. Now, were this to be denied me, it would be a disaster for me. That would be the end of who I consider myself to be. So w what that makes apparent is that these statuses as participants in these practices, what really matters is maintaining the status and having that mutual recognition. So that puts pay to all sorts of ideas about security, th that you can secure yourself by shooting any enemies or building a wall, a big wall. You can't secure yourself like that because what you want to secure is your status as this kind of free person or that, depending on the authority to practice you. So the identities that are of value to us are those we receive from our fellow participants in the practices that are dear to us. And for us, a very, very major um, uh, risk, whole sections of war studies focuses on risk, but they very seldom focus on the risk of exclusion from the practice, the risk of being denied recognition. So I have a, a, an italicized sentence here, which reads like this. What we see in these cases, where this risk is manifest, is that ethics is not some marginal concern which might come into play in the field of action from time to time, but is, on the contrary, must be understood as constraining the actors in these practices at every single point. So I would say of us this afternoon, and of every state in the world this afternoon, the major constraint would be that they want to be recognized in the appropriate way. It would be a disaster if they were reduced to colonies, once again, and it would be a disaster if, if you here were kicked, not afforded the recognition that enabled you to participate in this authoritative practice of university life. All right. Pause. <coughs> I, I hope that the afternoon is going like this. I hope that you've all got the key points I've rattled on about and you've got tick, 
tick, tick, tick. And you're thinking, ah, oh, he's, he's more or less right. I hope that's where we are. <laughs> so, so there's some distinctive features about global practices that I now want to talk about. So Sylvia and I argue that globally, there are two fundamental practices. And we need to think about them separately. What do we mean by global? Well, we mean that, one, geographically, but two, that just about everybody is a participant in these two practices, including all of you. So, um, and these practices have, have this feature. I mean, the two, let me name them. The first practice is the global rights practice, within which we as individuals recognize each other as holding certain fundamental human rights. In this practice, we have long arguments about what should be on the list of rights. Only negative liberties, positive liberties, what about uh, uh, third generation rights, and so on. But at least we have a core of rights that we think are fundamental. The global rights practice has got no boundaries. So those of us who think we've got human rights, think we've got those rights wherever we find ourselves. So. Um, you know, if I'm in Australia, I've got, I consider I've got these rights. And if Mirabile Dicto, I was whisked off to some other place and woke up, let's say, in Chad, I would still think I have these rights. So I, I, I don't, as it were, first have to find out where am I, and then say, oh, oh, well, ooh, ooh, this is Nigeria, I don't have these rights. What the difference is, in some places the rights are well protected. Some, in some places the rights are protected by states, in other places, like South Africa, they're protected by private security companies. Um, so protecting rights is one thing, but having rights is a form of recognition we give to each other. And the second global practice is the global practice of sovereign states. All of us are citizens of at least one state. There's a small category of people who are stateless, but that's of interest to international lawyers, but I'm talking about the bulk of us. And um, in states, uh, what is of value for the individual is to be a citizen of a state that is sovereign. In other words, is free, is not a colony of some other state. Now, the features of these two practices is that both of them are macro practices. In other words, they are practices of practices. And I think a huge amount of what if you think the theory we've got is important, it's the next step that, it's the steps that follow from now that make it really important, isn't it? The practices of world politics are macro practices. These are the holes that we and I are, are called upon to understand from the internal point of view. Now, there's several features of macro practices that I have to highlight. The first is they second order practices. So all of us belong to any number of things, practices. We belong to a family. We, some of us belong to churches, sports clubs, um, you know, cultural clubs of one kind or another, endless for social forms. But these social forms are then encapsulated within this wider, higher, second-order practice. So these macro practices are not simply a sum of the micro practices. There's a sense in which uh, the micro practices are embedded in the higher order practices. Secondly, the macro practices are comprehensive in the sense that they have no external boundary. The practice of states is comprehensive. The, you can't say, I'm going to leave this practice, goodbye. Well, you could if you got onto one of these trips that the man is organizing, Elon Musk. He's, he's organizing <laughs> some to the moon. So if you wanted to get on one of his trips, you could get out of this practice. But on this world, you are in this practice. Thirdly, um, these practices are of fundamental ethical importance to us. So I, most people <coughs> regard the sovereignty of their state as fundamental and their own human rights in the, in the human rights practice as fundamental. Fourthly, and uh, Sylvia and I argued long about this, but she, uh, I, I've come to realize she's right and I was wrong. These practices are coercive. 
it's really important for the liberals, because sitting around this table, I think a lot of you who were brought up in the liberal tradition, and the liberal tradition says, how do you understand states? Well, you read, Lob you read uh, Hobbes and Locke and Mill and through to Nozick and Ackerman and so on. On that view, you have rights. You want, uh, the rights are endangered in some kind of state of nature. How to solve that problem? You make contracts with one another and you form a state. And the state is then an elaborate uh, security apparatus. And um, uh, on our view, that's exactly not the way to think of it because we were born into these two practices. Nobody ever asked me whether I wanted to be a rights holder and nobody ever asked me whether I wanted to be a citizen of a state. I just arrived like that. So, and then finally, these macro practices are anarchical in form. So they are second order, comprehensive, fundamentally ethically important for the participants. They're coercive in that there's no way out, and uh, they have a form of being anarchical. Sim that's simply a technical term. There's no, there's no world state, and there's no, there's no government at the top of these two practices. So i am got six more minutes, I think. You're more Swiss than me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's uh, not true. But <laughs> 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 um, so I'll introduce this next section, but you can see where it's going. Uh, because I think it's at this point, once you've got the basic structure that I've outlined, you can then see how, what did Chomsky call it? He developed a generative grammar. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this is a generative grammar. Once you've understood what I've said so far, you can see how it's going to pan out for the rest. So the heading here is Global Practices, Participation as an Ongoing Ethical Challenge. So, so the, our argument there is each of us and everybody else in the world is a participant in a number of practices simultaneously. So if I consider myself at one and the same time, I'm a citizen of Britain and, the United, uh, and South Africa. I'm a member of my family, uh, either the nuclear one or, or the extended one. I am a member of the Anglican Church, either locally or extended. I'm a member of this fraternity of um, academic fraternity, which is global. Now, these practices in which we participate don't the, the ethical component of each of each one doesn't necessarily and often doesn't cohere with the ethical components of the other. So or we find ourselves members of multiple practices and life consists in trying to sort out the ethical conundrums of participating in these things at the same time. So the big, the really big um, conundrum of our age, I think, talk for hours about this, is the ethics embedded in the global rights practice, which gives individuals the freedoms that we value, comes into sharp conflict, often, or appears to, with the sovereignty practice, the global practice of sovereign states. Because here's a simple way you can think about it. If I'm a rights holder and life is going badly for me where I find myself, let's say, which is here. Food is short, a drought is coming, uh, uh, um, environmental problems are reducing the area to where I, where I live, to desert. I'm entitled to use my right, which you would recognize, I have a right to freedom of movement, to get out of here and go somewhere else to meet you in the hope that you and I could make a plan about all of us living a better life. So I might trek to some other place. And you could see that the world would, if you think of the world only in terms of the rights practice, individuals would be free to move around, make contracts, build new associations, and so on, to live a good life. But if you put your other hat on as a member of the <coughs> practice of sovereign states, we suddenly start thinking in terms of borders. And here come people wanting to move to where we are, to find a good life here. 
And we think, oh, well, we, we're entitled to police our border. So there seems to be a contradiction between the values embedded in the freedom of individuals and the value embedded in, embedded in the freedom of states. How to harmonize that? Now, we've made, I think, really considerable progress. And I'll mention two things, and then I'll stop. The one pro area of progress that we've made trying to harmonize individual rights and states' rights is with the incipient principle uh, of the responsibility to protect. So the idea, you can see how it neatly harmonizes this. It says everybody has got individual human rights, and states have a duty to look after those rights. Now, to have all the details of working that out haven't been worked out. Not everybody signed on to this in a real way, although they did sign on to it initially in uh, the General Assembly. But a much better example, and you can see why I'm getting despondent in my old age. A better example is the European Union. In the European Union, you have the 28 states who've come together in this union. They still are independent sovereign states, so they've not forfeited that freedom. But they all respect the individual rights of the participants in those states. And so within the union, there is freedom of movement. So if I decided I really wanted to be treated well like German professors are, I could move in or Swiss. <laughs> but Switzerland's not a member. But uh, I could move into, uh, without asking anybody's permission, I could just go in the European Union to wherever I like. So in the European Union, a harmony has been achieved between these, the ethics fundamental to those two practices. But the tensions between the practices we find you'll find all over the place. For example, tensions between the ethics embedded in uh, extreme Catholicism. How do you square that with at the same time being a citizen in a free state like Britain or America or whatever? So you can see how this might unpack. But I think the really interesting disputes in international relations, including the ones that have been <laughs> war, are best understood in terms of the conflicting ethics of the multiple practices we find ourselves in, in these practices of practices. Thank you.